Um, <clears throat> welcome, uh, um, everyone. So this is some work that I, um, <coughs> pardon me, <clears throat> is some work that I've been doing uh, over um, the last few, few maybe the last uh, year or so, uh, with uh, some some several colleagues. You can see their names. So some some of my postdocs, some our colleagues like uh, Ben Worrell, who's, who's in Oxford, and even somebody Florian Luca, who's from South Africa. So um, let me um, start with this uh, quote from uh, Don Knuth. Um, Science is what we understand well enough to explain to a computer. Art is everything else we do. Now, we may or, you know, you may or may not agree with this quote. I actually find with me that it resonates, uh, uh, you know, quite a bit, but I, I can see how uh, maybe um, some people may, may disagree. Um, <clears throat> but certainly, I think the spirit of uh, holomic techniques is uh, to turn um, some of the art into science. So to make, uh, to find systematic ways to do uh, certain things that um, previously were done in ad hoc ways. And so let me, um, if you've never heard of home techniques, this is, uh, this is perfect because I will uh, explain from scratch what they are. And um, before I do, um, just a quick question. What do all these things have in common? So this is a slide, by the way, that I've shamelessly stolen from Cyril Vanderheer. But yeah, I'll let you read it. I won't read out the slide, but yeah, I'll let you just have a look at the various, um, you know, the various items on the on this uh, slide. <clears throat> and it turns out all these things have in common the fact that they all rely on holonomic techniques. Uh, so you can see this is quite a, a you know pervasive sort of a, a set of techniques. And uh, let me uh, let me explain what they are through uh, a couple of examples. So suppose you're trying to prove this identity that uh, the sum of these binomial coefficient uh, squared is equal to 2n choose n. So um, one way you might uh, uh, do this is to say, well, let me count the ways I can choose n letters amongst two n letters, which of course is what the right-hand side is doing. So um, <clears throat> here I've got two n letters. I've got the a1 up to an, b1 up to bn. And of course there are two n choose n ways to pick n letters amongst those. And another way I could pick n letters amongst two n letters is I could say, well, let me pick k letters amongst the an, then n minus k letters amongst the bn. Of course, there are n choose uh, k ways to do the first thing, n choose n minus k ways to do the second thing. Now let me sum over all k. And of course, I'm counting the same thing. And so those two quantities are equal. Now the sum of n choose k times n choose n minus k. <clears throat> of course, n choose n minus k is equal to n choose k by symmetry. And so this is really the sum of n choose k squared. And I know from the previous um, line that it's equal to 2n choose n. So I've actually uh, proven my identity. And I would say, so this is, um, I think this is kind of a cute little proof. And, and I think uh, Knuth would refer to this as art. Uh, he would say, oh, you know, this proof, this was, it was not a systematic proof, but it was kind of a cute little argument. Now, how might we make this uh, systematic? And one way to do this is to, uh, and this is where holomic, holomic techniques come in. So let, let me try to walk you through it. So you label the left-hand side UN. You can see that this is a different number for every value of n. So you, the sequence of numbers you call un. And the right-hand side, you label vn. Okay, So again, this is different value for, for different values of n. So we call it vn. And the high-level strategy is as follows. You want to find a recurrence relation for the sequence un. You want to find a recurrence relation for sequence vn. And then from this, you want to deduce a recurrence relation for the sequence un minus vn. And you want to verify that un minus vn is identically 0 by checking the initial values of your recurrence. And then by induction, un will be uh, identically equal to vn, and you will have proven your, your identity. So how does this work in practice? Well, let's look at the right-hand side. The right-hand side, I said, is vn. So that's 2n choose n. So this 2n factorial over n factorial n factorial. So vn plus 1 is now 2n plus 2 choose n plus 1. So I expand it out. It gives this. And I expand it again. <clears throat> and I see that I've got 2n factorial here n factorial there, n factorial there. So I've got my vn term. And uh, rearrange things, and I get that n plus 1 squared times vn plus 1 is this polynomial times vn. And I have to give, and because every term depends on one previous term, so this is order 1. It's a recurrence of order 1, because vn plus 1 only depends on vn. I have to give just one initial condition, and just by inspection, v0 is equal to 1. What about the left-hand side? So the left-hand side, I label un. So it's the sum of k equals 0 to n of n choose k squared. And now if I want a recurrence for un plus 1, I'm a little bit stuck. I, you know, you can try to take a pen and, and, and paper, and it's a little bit, it's not sort of completely obvious. But it turns out that the summand, the n choose k squared, 
is so-called sister Selene summable. And I will come back to this, but for now, the details are hidden. And you can therefore use Zalberger's algorithm to get a recurrence. And the recurrence you get, Zalberger's algorithm, is um, n plus 1 times un plus 1 equals 4n plus 2 times un. And again, u0 is equal to 1. So if we put things together, got my sequence un and vn, I've got my recurrence for un plus 1, which I just derived uh, on the previous slide, my recurrence for vn plus 1. And I see that un and vn are uh, recurrences that are both of order 1, because it, they depend only on one previous term. So I say that they both satisfy a holonomic recurrence relation, um, which is a linear recurrence relation, but with polynomial coefficients. You can see that the coefficients are not constant, they're polynomial, but the recurrence is otherwise uh, linear. Um, there's no vn squared, there's no vn cubed. And both are of order one. So their difference will satisfy a holonomic recurrence relation of order two. This is by just a, a simple linear algebra argument. This is completely generic. Un minus vn will satisfy a recurrence relation of order two. And therefore, I only need to verify that u0 minus v0 is zero, u1 minus v1 is zero, and I just do this by inspection. And from this, because I know the recurrence is order two, then by induction, every un minus vn will actually be zero. And I conclude that uh, un is identically equal to vn. And I've proven my, uh, my identity in, a, in, this, in this way that can be made completely systematic. OK? So again, if there are questions, uh, please um, um, you know, uh, follow the protocol that Ohad uh, and then I'd be happy to take any, any questions. Uh. Now, <clears throat> in, uh, let's look at a slightly more complicated example. So in, in 77, Roger Aperi produced what has been described as a, a sensational proof of the irrationality of zeta of 3, where zeta is a Riemann zeta function. So zeta of 3 is this uh, sum here that you can see. And the critical ingredient in Aperi's proof is his use of these Aperi numbers. And these Aperi numbers are um, the summation of squares of binomial coefficients. And when he gave the talk, he, he didn't actually prove all the details. He claimed that these numbers, these an, satisfy the follow, following holonomic recurrence. So you've got a cubic polynomial times an plus 2 minus a cubic polynomial times an plus 1 plus a cubic polynomial times an <clears throat> is equal to zero. So this would be a holonomic recurrence of order two because an plus two depends on the previous two terms. And he was asked, well, how do you know this, the, the, you know, this recurrence? Where, where does this come from? And he gave the cryptic answer. He said, well, these identities, he said, they grow in my garden, which you know, wasn't so particularly helpful. But of course, number theorists wanted a proof that these uh, recurrences uh, were true. So van der Porten worked with uh, uh, Henri Cohen, another number theorist, and he writes, neither Cohen nor I had been able to prove the above in the intervening two months before the Inter International Congress of Mathematicians. Um, after days of fruitless effort, a specific problem was mentioned to Don Zagier, and with irritating speed, he showed that indeed the sequence satisfies the recurrence. This more or less broke the dam, and the rest of the proof was quickly conquered. But it did take these, um, you know, the, the, it, the, this problem, this establishing this, this, uh, these numbers satisfy this recurrence, did stump these two number theorists for a couple of months. Uh, now, unfortunately, van der Porten was a couple decades too early, because if he tried this 20 years later, instead of using Zagier, he could have used Zalberger, in particular Zalberger's algorithm, not only to prove the recurrence, but even to derive it from scratch. So here's a picture of Doran Zalberger with a a fitting uh, t-shirt. And um, <clears throat> indeed, this is implemented, for instance, in the sum tools uh, package on Maple. You use the function sum recursion. Here you put in the binomial, the expression for the upper, uh, uh, expression. And completely automatically, you will get the recurrence that is the upper recurrence that we had on the previous slide. So you don't even have, not only can Maple prove this, it can even tell you what the re recurrence is. So, so this is indeed, uh, you know, I think this is somehow, uh, certainly I find this quite impressive, uh, qu quite powerful. Let's look at another example, a third example, now a continuous example this time. Suppose you're asked uh, to prove that sine of 2x is 2 sine x cos x. And I guess now the question is, well, what are you allowed to assume? So we're going to assume the differential equations that govern sine and cos. Um, so it's the same differential equation, of course. So the, the double derivative of sine is minus uh, sine. Likewise for cos, but the initial conditions are different, so we have to give the initial condition sine of 0 is 0, sine prime of 0 is 1, and likewise for cos. 
And um, now what you do is this is going to be the same strategy. We're going to label the left-hand side f of x, the right-hand side g of x, and we want to show that f of x minus g of x is identically zero. OK, so how are we going to do this? Well, the left-hand side, uh, by the chain rule, satisfies the following differential equation. Now, the right, so f of x satisfies a second-order linear differential equation. The right-hand side, g of x, is the product of two functions, each of which satisfies a second-order linear differential equation. So g of x satisfies a, fo a fourth-order, or at most fourth-order, linear differential equation. Again, this is completely standard. If you take the product of two ODEs that satisfy uh, a second-order ODE of order two, then the product will satisfy an ODE of order, the product of the order, so order four. This is, again, by linear algebra. And the difference will therefore satisfy a linear ODE of order at most six. Okay, and you can completely construct these ODEs just again from linear algebra. And what then you need to verify are what are the initial conditions. And you can read off the initial conditions from these. You can derive them from what's in this box here. So you find that h of zero is h prime of zero, h, h double prime of zero, all the way up to h to the five. You need six conditions because you have order six. And then you can invoke the picard uh, lindelof uh, theorem to say that, oh, well, the solution is unique. And because the zero function satisfies it, then the function has to be identically zero. In other words, f of x uh, has to be identically equal to g of x. And you've proven your identity in this, in this completely systematic way. OK, so let me define now these things formally. So I'm going to define holomic sequences and holomic functions. Uh, so a sequence of real a sequence u n of real numbers is holonomic or p finite or p recursive if it satisfies a linear recurrence relation with polynomial coefficients. So you have polynomials p zero uh, to p k. These are uh, polynomials in one variable with rational coefficients such that p k of n times u n plus k depends linearly on the previous k terms, where the coefficients are p k p sub k minus one of n times u sub n plus k minus one, etc. The, the coefficients are given by the polynomials. Okay, but the but but the the these uh, these terms only appear um, uh, raised to the power one, so that's why it's a uh, uh, I, I call it linear. And whenever you've got uh, whenever a sequence of numbers obeys such a, a recurrence equation, it is a by definition a holonomic uh, recurrence. Um, uh, uh, sequence. So examples, uh, the factorial numbers, the Fibonacci numbers, harmonic numbers, Perrin numbers, Motkin, Catalan, Affery, etc. There are lots of examples. Also, the Taylor coefficients of many, many functions. And as we'll see later, this is not a coincidence. And let's just see, let's just look at a quick example. So if you look at the Taylor series of sine x, so this is uh, it's given here. And so if you now list the coefficients, so all the even order uh, powers have coefficient zero. Okay, so x squared is coefficient zero, for instance. But all the odd uh, order powers, they alternate signs. So you get one minus one over three factorial plus one over five factorial, etc. And you can very easily see that the recurrence, the holonomic recurrence relation that these coefficients satisfy is n plus two times n plus one times u n plus two is minus u n. And the initial conditions are u zero equals zero and u one equals one. OK, um, now, according to uh, Manuel Cowers, uh, approximately order of the sequences in the OEIS are holonomic. But of course, uh, there are many non-examples. Um, here's some non-example, 2 to the 2 to the n, the sequence of numbers log n, the Bernoulli numbers, prime numbers, these are all non-holonomic sequences, probably not holonomic. <coughs> and um, holonomic sequences have some very nice closure properties. So if u and vn are holonomic, then there's some are holonomic, the product, the pointwise product are holonomic, shift, uh, sh the shifted sequence holonomic, the partial, the sequence of partial sums is holonomic, and the Cauchy product, which is what you would uh, do if you take the, um, the product of power series, this is also holonomic. So this makes holonomic sequences a great class for computer algebra. Um, and I should say one thing that's important to note is all these operations are completely effective. So if you give me the recurrence for UN, the recurrence for VN, the recurrences for all of these things can be elicited completely uh, uh, mechanically. Now, in terms of algorithms, because after all, this is what we're interested in, um, we can, uh, uh, so first of all, you have to define, I guess, how you input a holonomic sequence. A, a holonomic sequence, by definition, it's an infinite sequence of numbers. 
So you have to input it in a finite way, but you can do this because you only need to provide the recurrence relation together with finally many initial values. And if you do this, you've defined the sequence uniquely. And then the main result is that given two holomic sequences, UN and VN, with initial values in some field or some ring where you can make comparisons, so here I've taken the uh, algebraic numbers, the uh, equality problem or the identity problem where, where whether UN is identically equal to VN is a decidable problem. So the slogan is that uh, equality is decidable for all sequences. Let's have a quick look at functions. Um, so a function now from an interval, so i is a, an interval of the reals, into the reals is holonomic or definite. D here stands for differentially uh, finite. If it satisfies a linear uh, different equation with polynomial coefficients, so very similar to the previous definition, so you have polynomials p0 up to pk with rational coefficients. So these are polynomials in one continuous variable x such that the following differential equation holds. So p0 of x <coughs> times f of x plus p1 of x times f prime of x, dot, 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 pk of x times the k derivative of f at x is equal to zero. Examples, out all algebraic functions, sine x, e to the x, log x, the Bessel functions, hypergeometric functions, etc. Many, many functions are holonomic. In fact, according again to Cowers, Approximately 60% of the functions in this uh, handbook of mathematical functions are uh, holonomic. Okay, so closure properties, uh, as you can expect, uh, we have also closure properties. So uh, you can uh, take the sum of holonomic functions or product, you can uh, integrate them, indefinite integration, differentiate, and compose with an algebraic function. So if A is an algebraic function, then F of A of X uh, is a holonomic sequence, uh, function. And again, all these operations are effective. And now the, um, the main result <coughs> in terms of uh, algorithms. So if i is an interval, let's assume that 0 belongs to your interval. If this is without loss of generality, because if that were not the case, you could uh, shift. You could perform a shift. And now to define a holonomic function, you only need to provide the differential equation together with finally many initial values f0, f prime of 0, f double prime of 0. And this is provided that zero is not a root of the polynomial coefficient of the highest order term of the differential equation. This is a technical condition for the picard lindelof uh, theorem to hold. And if it doesn't hold, it's okay. Just pick another uh, point. Um, because polynomials have only finitely many zeros, you can always do this. So this is without loss of generality. And now the result says, if you have two holonomic functions, f and g, with initial values, let's say in the algebraic numbers, the equality problem, the identity problem is f Identical, uh, identically equal to G is decidable. And therefore, equality of functions, of holonomic functions, is decidable. That is the slope. OK. So let's talk a little bit, uh, sorry. <clears throat> and now we come to what I think is um, a really important uh, central result, uh, what I like to call the fundamental theorem of holonomy theory. That's, um, I must confess, um, I'm the only person who calls it that, I think. It should be called that, but if you Google fundamental theorem of holonomy theory, you're not going to find it. But I'm trying to start a trend. Um, so what does this say? Uh, if un is a holonomic sequence, then if you form the generating function f of x, which is the sum of un x to the n, that will be a holonomic function. And conversely, if you have a holonomic function, its sequence of Taylor coefficients uh, will al always be a holonomic sequence. Okay, so the, if f is a holonomic um, function, then the uns are a holonomic sequence and conversely. And these things, of course, are effective. You can go from one to the other in a completely mechanical way. So for instance, uh, if you take the Fibonacci sequence, uh, the classical sequence 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, etc., and you form the generating function, you get the following rational function, x over 1 minus x minus x squared, which is very easy to see is holonomic because it satisfies a, a first order differential equation. It's uh, just um, a very, uh, very simple uh, differential equation. Uh, okay, so let's talk, let me just very briefly speak about the history of holonomic techniques. Um, so the most basic holonomic sequence you can think of that's not completely trivial will be the a geometric progression. So something like b times un plus one is equal to a times un. So the nth term will be given by a over b to the n time whatever the value of u0 is. That's a geometric sequence. 
And let's now replace the constants A and B by polynomials. So now I have B of n times un plus 1 is A of n times un, where B of n and A of n are polynomials. And I get not the geometric sequence now, I get a hypergeometric sequence. And if I form the power series, the generating function, I get the, uh, the class of hypergeometric functions, which um, are <clears throat> there's some classical notation for them, uh, which is uh, here. And these will include the exponential function, logarithmic, trigonometric, binomial, Bessel function, and many classical orthogonal polynomial functions. Um, the, the study of hypergeometric function actually began with Wallace. It seems he's the first to have used this, this term. And then there was work by Euler, and then there by Gauss, by Coomer, by Riemann, Ramanujan, and even contemporary uh, number theorists like Boykers and Zudelin. Um, in fact, uh, it's a ma mainstream uh, research uh, area in number theory, and you have these people who are world experts on hypergeometric uh, functions and sequences. Um, now, hypergeometric sequences are first-order holomic sequences. Every sequence depends only on one other term, but of course, um, you can uh, consider holomic sequences of arbitrary order, and the systematic study of, of these was undertaken by Poincaré in the late 19th century. And he was mainly interested in asymptotics. Um, then there was a, a lot more work by people like Perron, uh, Coman, uh, Salvi, Flagellet, who is depicted here, on asymptotics and, and on other properties of sequences. And there was, and, and but of course, as computer scientists, um, you know, again, my, my, my one of my uh, interests is uh, algorithmic, and I would, it seems the, the proper algorithmic uh, study of holomic sequences really began with uh, the advent of uh, the work of Sister Mary Celine Fazenmeyer, um, who, um, so this woman was a, a Catholic nun uh, in Pennsylvania. And while, speaking, while she was a nun, she um, wrote a PhD thesis in, in mathematics at the University of Michigan, uh, in which she developed this algorithmic method to find recurrence relations satisfied by sums of terms of hypergeometric sequences. Uh, and if you remember, the, um, the, what, what we had at the very uh, beginning, the first example, was precisely the kind of sums of terms for which you would find a recurrence relation, a hypergeometric recurrence relation. She had the completely systematic method to do this. Um, and, um, <clears throat> and unfortunately, she abandoned mathematics. I mean, she published a couple of papers, and then she went back to um, um, her duties as a nun, I guess. Uh, but she didn't do any further mathematics. But her work was uh, uh, extremely influential. And there was more work later on, particularly by people like Gosper, Stanley, Gessel, Lipschitz. And this was all weaponized by Zalberger in a seminal 1990 paper, a holonomic systems approach to special function identities, uh, in which he developed this completely systematically, not just for uh, single variable holonomic uh, functions and sequences, but multivariable, in which you can have so uh, some continuous variables and discrete variables, and he, he, um, ba he, he based a system, an algorithmic system for proving identities of, of such things based on Bernstein's uh, deep theory of D modules in differential algebra. So this is actually uh, quite, um, quite deep work. And he later published a book focusing only on hypergeometric uh, sequences and functions. The book is called A equals B, written by, uh, with two co-authors, Pekosek and uh, Wilf. And Don Knuth wrote the foreword, and he has the following to say. Um, I fell in love with these procedures as soon as I learned them, because they worked for me immediately. Not only did they dispose of sums that I, I had wrestled with long and hard in the past, they also knocked off two new problems that I was working on at the time I first tried them. The success rate was astonishing. This book will help you reach new frontiers. So, Indeed, very high praise from uh, clearly, um, you know, one of the masters of um, these kind of um, identities. So <clears throat> now I'd like to, uh, so this is, um, holomic techniques are really uh, uh, um, a wonderful thing. And um, by the way, there are also implementations of these, uh, uh, these techniques in, in Mathematica, in, 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 uh, Mat in Maple. Um, if, you, if you Google for GFUN or MGFUN, you will see, um, you can download these things and try them. But what I'd like to talk about now is some of the limitations of this framework. And in particular, some of the limitations involve deciding uh, not, in, not equalities, but inequalities, and also computing asymptotics. So let me, um, let me illustrate this uh, by giving you three problems that um, at present we don't know how to solve. So the first one um, 
is hypergeometric inequality. So we know how to check equality of hypergeometric sequences. But suppose you've given two hypergeometric sequences, un and vn, let's say over the rational numbers. You want an algorithm that tells you whether or not it is the case that for all n, un is greater or equal to vn. OK? Another problem is uh, the positivity problem. So un is a holomic sequence, and you want to know whether all terms are non-negative. So it's a uh, more case than the, the first problem. And the third problem is called minimality problem. Um, so un is a holomic sequence, and you want to know if it's minimal. Now, I haven't yet defined what minimal means. I will in a second. But just as a special case to sort of um, um, get a, a picture in your head, um, you know, very natural question is you can ask, is it the case that un tends to 0 as n tends to infinity? And perhaps surprisingly, uh, in view of what I've you know, said previously, none of these problems are known to be decidable. Uh, although we know some, some things about the problems, and I want to talk, talk about um, uh, you know, some of the, the uh, you know, some things we know about them. One thing I should say is that the first sort of part of the talk where I was focusing on e equalities and identities had a very algebraic flavor. And whereas the kind of these kind of problems that I'm describing now have, have a very analytic uh, flavor, and uh, the 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 uh, speaking of um, the differences between algebra and analysis, there is this I, I find very funny anecdote by David Mador, who's a French mathematician, who writes, um, "I was once dining at the IHES. It must have been in '96, and I happened to be seated right next to I am Gelfand, who is uh, depicted here. When I said I wanted to become a mathematician, he asked whether I preferred algebra or analysis, and I said algebra." I don't understand why people want to study algebra, replied Gelfand, because in algebra, you write A equals B. But if A equals B, then A and B are the same thing. So you're writing A equals A. What's the point of that? Well, I'm not as smart as Gelfand, so I wrote my PhD in algebraic geometry anyway. Now, it's interesting, because the title of uh, the Zauberger book, this uh, celebrated book, is actually A equals B, which is, uh, which is actually interesting. Um, OK, so let me, let me um, uh, uh, explain a little bit what these, uh, the kind of the questions uh, in more detail, the questions that I uh, just raised, uh, what, what they're about. And let me do this by um, means of a, by, by way of an example. So let, let's consider the Fibonacci recurrence equation. I think everybody's favorite recurrence uh, equation. So xn plus 2 equals xn plus 1 plus xn. Now we say that a sequence satisfying this equation is a solution. So a solution of this recurrence is any sequence of numbers that satisfies this equation. So of course, the Fibonacci numbers do satisfy this equation. But if you start not with 0, 1, but with some other number, like minus 3, 7, you will get a sequence, right, just, just by developing it. And now you can see that the set of all such solutions is a two-dimensional vector space. Because of course, if you take two solutions and you add them, then again, the, 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 what you get is, again, something that satisfies the recurrence. If you multiply by a constant, then again, you get uh, another solution to the recurrence. So they form a vector space. It's two-dimensional because once you fix the first two values, then, of course, you fix the entire sequence. So I can now define what being minimal means. <clears throat> and this is going to be general. A non-zero solution un is minimal if, for any other linearly independent solution vn, we have that the ratio of un over vn tends to 0 as n tends to infinity. So let's see what this means for the Fibonacci sequence. Now, we know, probably you remember this from, from, from uh, high school, or if you've taken any kind of course in discrete math, I'm sure most people know this. Um, any solution to the Fibonacci recurrence can always be written, uh, un can always be written as um, a times uh, phi to the n plus b times phi bar to the n, where phi is the golden ratio, and phi bar is the uh, Galois conjugate of the golden ratio, and a and b are two real numbers. Now, the golden ratio in absolute value is bigger than 1. So if a is not 0, this term will diverge to plus or minus infinity. But the, the, the phi bar is actually as absolute less than 1. So no matter what b is, this term here will always tend to 0. So now we can see, we can read off this very easily, what the minimal solutions are. The minimal solutions are precisely those solutions in which a is 0, OK? Because they tend to 0. And if you take a linearly independent solution, this will have to have a non-zero value for a. And then, of course, the ratio will tend to 0. So let's see this in a, in a, a pictorially. So here's r squared. And I want you to look at this and see it as the vector space of Fibonacci sequences. So any point here is an entire infinite sequence. 
And the point is identified with the first two values of the sequence. So for instance, so uh, the classical Fibonacci sequence, which starts with 0, 1, sits at the point 0, 1. And once you've given the first two values, the entire sequence, it determines the entire sequence. Now, phi bar is a negative number whose absolute value is slightly less than 1, so it's here. And this, the subspace of minimal solution is this blue line, OK? In particular, it contains the point 1, comma phi bar. And one very important aspect of this is the so-called critical ratio, which we denote as mu, and that's the slope of this blue line. And in particular, the mu here you can see is phi bar, because the point 1, comma phi bar um, is, is on this blue line. OK, so let's have, a, let's have another look. Let's have a look at another uh, graph. So now I'm going to plot un against n, where un is a solution to the Fibonacci recurrence. So here n is on the uh, horizontal axis, and un is on the vertical axis. And suppose I start with the first two values, 1, comma, phi bar. So phi bar is here. Then I get something like this. So I get 1, phi bar, and then I see that I quickly decay to 0. I tend to 0 as n tends to infinity, unsurprisingly. What if I were to start at 1, comma, a number that is slightly above phi bar? Then I'll get something like this. So unsurprisingly, I will mimic the minimal solution initially, but then around 15 or so, I start diverging, and then I quickly diverge to plus infinity. And if I were to start at a number that is 1, comma, something slightly below phi bar, so just a little bit below here, then I would get something like this. So I would, again, mimic the solution till about 15 or so, and then I would diverge to minus infinity. So if we come back to our graphic, any sequence that starts with a critical a ratio of the first two terms being above phi bar, so that will be above the blue line here in this region of the, 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 the in this region of space, uh, will tend to plus infinity. Anything that starts here below the, the, the blue line will tend to minus infinity, and anything that starts on the blue line will tend to the sequence will tend to zero. Okay, which is why you can now see why this is a critical ratio, because we're talking about the ratio of the first two terms. Okay, so let's um, look at another uh, example involving the Apari numbers again. So um, uh, remember the Apari recurrence equation was, um, well, maybe you don't remember exactly it, but here it is again. And the Apari numbers were these, um, these uh, sum of square of binomial, a product of square of binomial coefficients, but numerically, they go like this. It's one, the first two values are 1 and 5, and then they go 73, 14, 45, et cetera, et cetera. And another solution begins with 0, 6. And then you get a bunch of rational numbers. And the reason they're rational numbers is because when you're computing xn plus 2, you have to divide by n plus 2 cubed, which is why you get numbers that are not uh, whole numbers. But it's a solution. So if you start 1, 5, you start 0, 6, you get two solutions, two perfectly valid solutions, the upper recurrence. And therefore, any linear combination of them will also be a solution. So you, you let un be a bn minus zeta of 3 times a n. Then un is a solution of the upper recurrence uh, 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 equation. And the punchline of Apari's proof is the fact that un, the sequence, tends to 0 fast as n tends to infinity, which shows by completely elementary means that zeta of 3 cannot be a rational number. OK, but what this tells us, the immediate consequence, um, is that un is a minimal solution of the Apari recurrence. So if un is a minimal uh, solution, what is the critical ratio? So that's the ratio of the first two terms. That's going to be u1 over u0. Well, you can calculate it. Just plug in u1 over u0 here. And you do that, and you find that mu, the critical ratio of the Apari recurrence, is 5, mi 5 minus 6 over zeta of 3. But it's kind of very interesting because zeta of 3 is, is a pretty funky number. I mean, we don't even know if it's, we know it's irrational to make Zapari. We don't even know if it's transcendental, though most people think it is transcendental. So you can have a recurrence that's somewhat innocent looking like this that will have, that will lead to a critical ratio that is potentially transcendental. So if you're trying to decide, am I on the critical ratio or am I above or am I below it, you need to need to compare a real number with another number, the critical ratio, which potentially could be transcendental like this. So which brings us to <clears throat> comparing real numbers. So here um, is, um, is an interesting um, uh, purported identity or equality. So here you've got an infinite sum, doubly infinite sum. And you're, um, you're asked whether is this equal to square root of pi? 
Okay, well, it turns out this is false, but the two sides actually agree to over 42 billion digits, uh, which is quite remarkable. This comes from um, a very interesting paper by the Borwein uh, brothers uh, called Strange Theories in High Precision Fraud. Um, and it shows that, well, I mean, this is something as computer scientists we know very well, that comparing real numbers, uh, you know, in general, it's undecidable. Um, but there is a class of numbers for which uh, it is believed uh, this can be done. And this is a very large class of numbers, which includes algebraic numbers and their periods. Um, so they're introduced by Kantovich and Zagier in 2001. Uh, so periods are, what, it, what is a period? The definition is here, but let, let's just look at the, the integral. An integral of an algebraic function G over a semi-algebraic domain D. So G is any algebraic function, D is any semi-algebraic set, and such an integral uh, is a period. If it converges and gives you a number, that number is a period. So here is Don Zagier by the time he had a beard, and Konsevich was his PhD student and um, went on, of course, to win the, the Fields Medal in, in uh, 98. But they formally defined periods, but of course, periods go back uh, further. They go back to Zendik. And in fact, Rotendik had already formulated a conjecture about periods. And let me read it up to you um, because it's, it's quite entertaining. Um, let x be a smooth projected variety over the rational, the algebraic numbers, and let xcn denote the compact complex analytic manifold that it defines. The Grotendieck period conjecture in codimension k on x asserts that any class alpha in the algebraic Durham cohomology group here uh, of x over uh, q bar such that this integral is a rational number for every rational homology class gamma in this uh, set is the class in algebraic homology of some algebraic cycle of co-dimension k and x with rational coefficient. Now, I must confess, I have absolutely no idea what this says. And I, in fact, I have the greatest admiration for people who understand these things because they look just just uh, in very, very scary, uh, uh, scarily com uh, scar uh, complicated to me. Now, thankfully, and essentially, equivalent conjecture was formulated by Konstantinovich and Zagier in the paper. And it says it is decidable whether two given periods are not, uh, two given pe uh, periods are equal or not. And in the sequel, we find this form of the conjecture a little bit uh, more readable uh, to use. So we will use um, that instead. Now, it turns out Konstantinovich and Zagier also introduced more general notions of exponential periods and with similar conjecture. And you can further generalize this and so on. But let, I, I won't have time to go into such details. But let me now um, if, go, take you through one last example. And in this example, I want to illustrate the techniques you, uh, you would uh, deploy if you wanted to know whether a particular recurrence was uh, minimal or a particular re recurrence was positive. Okay, how would we go about solving this? So this is the simplest example that I could cook up that is not uh, completely trivial. So here, consider the second order degree once recurrence. So it's second order because every term depends um, on two previous terms and it's degree one because the polynomials in questions are all linear polynomials, fine polynomials, right? You, 2n plus 3, 6n plus 7, 4n minus 4n plus 1. And um, the problem, formally speaking, given the first two terms, I begin my, instead of starting at u0 and u1, I begin at u minus 1 and u0 because that's how we wrote the paper. Um, but it's obviously the same thing. So I, be, I, I give you the first two terms of the se of a sequence that obeys this uh, recurrence. And let's assume the first two terms are rational or let's say real algebraic. And I want to decide whether or not the full sequence is minimal or whether or not the full sequence is positive, for instance. These are two things. So how would I go about this? So in order to do this, I, I will sort of take you through uh, some of the, the, the techniques that are used. And um, some of these, make use of classical theorems, I, I, I will just state them. Um, so, so uh, but I won't, obviously can't explain all the, all the steps. Um, so the first thing you do is you form the characteristic polynomial of the sequence, but you get a sequence of characteristic polynomials, one for each n. So you, the characteristic polynomial is this quadratic polynomial in Z. And the roots, you denote them lambda n and big lambda n. And now you can show, and it's very straightforward, that the, the small lambda n's tend to uh, 1, tend to little lambda, which is 1. And the big lambda n's tend to some value little la big lambda, which is uh, 2, as n tends to infinity. And now there is a uh, classical result of Poincaré and Perron, which says that if you have any solution to this recurrence, any un that is a sequence, a solution to this recurrence, 
the ratio of consecutive terms will tend either to the small lambda or to the big lambda. By the way, we have the same thing for the Fibonacci sequence. The ratio of consecutive terms of Fibonacci sequence, they always tend either to the golden ratio or the Galois conjugate. And basically this theorem says the same thing, except you have to calculate these roots a little bit differently. Okay, now you can clearly see that a sequence is minimal if and only if you're actually tending to the small lambda. Because when the ratio of consecutive terms tends to small lambda, that means ratio of consecutive terms tends to one. And so the terms don't grow very fast. But if the ratio of consecutive terms tend to two, then the terms grow much faster. So the minimal solutions are those in which the ratio of consecutive terms tend to one. Okay, now what is the critical ratio? Um, well, let me rewrite the recurrence relation like this. All I've done is I've divided by 2n plus 3, which was previously um, multiplying the term xn. And now there is a general theorem called Pinkerl's uh, theorem that tells you that mu can always be expressed as an infinite continued fraction in terms of these rational functions. Okay? And um, so the, the k here stands for is the notation for infinite continued fraction, and I've developed the first few terms here. And these things you can you can um, they converge or you can you can check if they you can decide if they converge or not and when they do converge you can actually approximate the ratio and the value here is approximately 0.511238 etc. Um, it turns out in this particular case that the ratio is also equal to uh, the critical ratio is equal to ratio of Gaussian hypergeometric functions evaluated at these rational points um, but you don't always have such a closed form in any event. I can approximate this ratio, like I said, but I don't know if this number is a rational number or an algebraic number. And most likely it's a transcendental number for all I know, but I really don't know what it is. In general, infinite continued fraction, well, you know, rational infinite continued fraction of this form, very little is known about their, um, you know, their property as a number. And so if I give you the first two terms of a sequence and ask you, is the ratio of these first two terms equal to this mu, this is something we don't know how to decide. I mean, we really don't know how to do, right? People look at continued fraction, but in general, these things are very hard to do. Now, let's plot the ratio of, let's consider our recurrence, okay? So here it is. And let's plot the ratio of consecutive terms against n. So I'm, I'm going to plot un over un minus one as n uh, grows. So the, ra the critical ratio mu is here, little lambda is there, big lambda is there. Okay, now if I start on the critical ratio, if, if u, u minus 1 divided by, if u0 divided by mu minus 1 is equal to mu, then by definition, I am a minimal solution. And indeed, the ratio of consecutive terms, as you can see, will tend to little lambda. Okay, so these graphs are produced with Mathematica. So, um, uh, so, so I didn't just make it up. Now, what if I start a little bit above mu? So if the ratio of consecutive terms is a little mu, then you can see that um, the ratio, of, sorry, the initial ratio is above mu, then the ratio of consecutive terms tend to big lambda. And maybe I start a little bit closer to mu, but still above mu, and again, I will tend to big lambda. What if I start below? Then you can see that I go negative, meaning that one of un or un minus one at some point becomes negative. And then I go positive again, and then I converge to big lambda. And then if I start a little bit closer, the same phenomenon happens, but I go negative, it takes a bit longer and then I go positive and I go to big lambda. Okay, so you can see that um, if I'm starting on, if my initial ratio is equal to mu, then I will converge to little lambda as expected. But if I start either above mu or below mu, then my ratio of consecutive terms tends to big lambda as expected. But how am I to decide? So if I give you an initial ratio that differs from mu by 42 billion digits, then you're gonna be on this trajectory for a really long time. Or for that matter, if I give you a ratio of initial values that is equal to mu, you're going to be in tra this trajectory forever. And how do you ever decide that, you, yes, you are in this trajectory or no, you're not on this trajectory? Given that the only handle I have on mu is an infinite continued fraction that I cannot really compare numbers to. Okay, so this is, this is kind of a, the, 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 problems we're the problem we're facing. And to solve it, we borrow a trick from analysis. So here's what Erich uh, Hecke had to say about this. Um, those of you who, who can read German um, can read what he says, but in English it says, it is a fact that the precise knowledge of the behavior of an analytic function in the vicinity of its singular points is a source of arithmetic properties. And what we do is we form the generating function 
of the UNs. Okay, so here I've shifted by one because I start at u sub minus one, but really it's the generating function of the UN. So it's a summation n equals zero to infinity of u sub n minus one times x to the n. And the point is, when the ratio of consecutive terms tends to big lambda, tends to two, well, the radius of convergence of f will have to be a half, okay, by the ratio test. If, if the ratio of consecutive u's tends to two, then to converge, my x has to be less than a half, less than or equal to a half. On the other hand, if the ratio of consecutive terms tends to one, my radius of convergence of f will be one. So I can determine whether or not I am my initial ratio is on mu, or whether or not it's not, by determining what the ratio of convergence of f is. Okay, that's going to be my strategy. So I want to find out what the ratio of my of this generating function, not the ratio, the radius of convergence of this generating function is. Okay, whether it's whether it's a half or whether it's one. And so um, to do this um, this analysis, so I let f of x be this. And now by the fundamental theorem of Holonomy theory. I know that f obeys a differential equation because the un is a holomic sequence. So my holomic differential equation, here it is. You can get this uh, completely mechanically and then you can solve it also completely mechanically. So let's look at the solution. So f of x is uh, a square root of one minus x times an integral from zero to x of, a f of an algebraic function of y. So you can see this function of y has the term u zero and u minus one, so these are to rational numbers or real algebraic numbers. So this is an algebraic uh, function of y. And then it's got a denominator, which is um, given here. And then you notice that this, this, the function is a pole at x equals a half. Because if you, if you plug in x equals a half here, then this expression is 0. And so if f is going to have, if you're on the minimal, on the, on the critical ratio, if your ratio of initial terms is on the critical ratio, in other words, if un is a minimal sequence, and f has a radius of convergence of one, then this pole here had better be canceled by a zero on the numerator. Now, if you look at the numerator, it cannot be the square root of one minus x, because when you plug in x equals a half here, square root of one minus x will just be square root of a half. So the, the pole has to be, that this pole has to be equal to zero, okay? For the radius of convergence to have a chance to be one, otherwise it absolutely cannot be one. So in other words, I've shown that if un is minimal, then this um, integral has to be zero. And conversely, you can show that this integral can only be zero in one place, basically. So, so that shows the converse. Uh, this needs to be proven, of course. And now if you look again at this integral, it's an integral of an algebraic function over an interval zero a half. So of course, it is a period. So if you believe the concept of Zagier conjecture, you believe that this is something you can decide, whether this integral is zero or not. And um, now, like I said, I took a simple example. Sometimes you get more complicated integrals than this, but then you get integral uh, that are exponential periods, for instance. And you can, you know, you, well, conjecturally, you can still solve these kinds of problems. So let's just come back um, to our graph for a minute. So we've just uh, asserted that un is minimal if the integ this integral is zero. What about positivity? Well, the positivity of the sequence un is the same as the positivity of the sequence of ratios, because if un is always positive, then the ratio is always positive. And if un is at some point becomes negative, the ratio will become negative at some point. And now you can see that if you start above the critical ratio, you will be positive. If you start on the critical ratio, you'll be positive. But if you start below, you'll be negative. And you can show this for this particular um, uh, recurrence. This is a general uh, case. So un will be positive either if it's minimal or if u0 over u minus 1 is greater than mu, which is something that you can definitely verify by approximating mu uh, closely enough. And this is a general uh, result. So <clears throat> if you consider holomic sequences over real algebraic numbers, then for second order sequences, the positivity problem reduces to the minimality problem. Um, moreover, the degree one, for degree one sequences, the positivity problem and the minimal, minimality problems reduce to determining whether a period, an exponential period, or period-like integral are equal to zero. And this is also related to uh, some properties of Fafian functions that I cannot uh, go into uh, here. And uh, likewise, the hypergeometric inequality problem reduces to determining whether a period is zero or not. Okay, so what is the outlook? Um, well. If you look at um, holomic um, uh, uh, functions and sequences, 
The theory of equality for these objects is very well understood. But what I uh, think is, uh, what I feel is a vastly underexplored territory is the algorithmic treatment of not the algebraic, but the analytic properties of these, of such things, such as inequalities, uh, such as asymptotics. And here we've only looked at a couple of problems involve sequences, but there's a whole slew of problems involving also functions that one can consider. So in other words, um, in the in the sort of philosophy of Donald Knuth, what we want to do is um, move more of the art into into the science. Uh, okay, so uh, uh, thanks. I'll I'll stop here. Thanks. <clears throat> um, any questions? Please raise your hand if you have a question. See if I can yeah, we it. have a clap okay. on the on the chat. Just, just thanks for the talk. Do I stop sharing? Okay, if, if no one has a question, I have a question. Um, what happens if you, if you move away from, from uh, um, the rationals, if I want to work relative to, to an algebraic uh, uh, structure? Um, How much of, of it? I mean, I know this is not the direction you want to look at, but uh, um, as a new I move away from the rational. Sorry, what do you mean by this? So, so I'm assuming that my sequence is, is in some kind of a, a semi-ring or, or, or something along those lines. Um, so, how much can I reproduce? So, if you if you're looking at um, algebraic, uh, real algebraic numbers, then everything that I, I said sort of works fine. Um, I mean, you have to work in a ring where you can compare numbers, right? Because otherwise, things are more or less hopeless. Um, now, beyond algebraic num real algebraic numbers, I, 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 I don't know that you, there's no sort of real natural ring that you could consider, I guess. Um, or, or maybe you have something in mind, uh, Ohad? Um, I've just been thinking about all kinds of very formal algebraic structures, so, so I'm just wondering how, how much you can reproduce if, if, oh, if you know something I, about the sequence. Yeah, I see, yeah, see, like a ring, uh, oh, I see, so like rings of functions or things like this. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, or, or polynomial, or even rings of polynomials, or those things, and so on. That's a super good question. That's a super. Good, I don't know. I have not looked at that, but that's a very good question. Thanks. Yeah, I, and I think it would be interesting to to um, it would be interesting to to investigate. Thanks. Does anyone else have a question? Yeah, Prakash. Hi. Um, thanks for a great talk, Joel. So uh, you, you've given very many interesting examples of applications to mathematics. I was wondering if there were problems like, for example, reachability properties of Markov chains or something that could be connected to asymptotics of holonomic sequences. Um, that's a really interesting question because that's, that was, I mean, my motivation looking at these things, of course, comes from these kind of reachability questions. So if you consider a special case, of holonomic uh, sequences where the polynomials are all constant. Then you have the so-called C finite recurrences. So these are the typical linear recurrent sequences like Fibonacci. And then of course, um, uh, you can view these things. Uh, th these are very intimately connected with orbits of uh, Markov chains, right? I mean, um, if you take a Markov chain and you look, you, you think of it as a distribution transformer and you look at the sequence of distributions you get by repeatedly applying the stochastic matrix to your initial distribution, um, the orbit of that dynamical system um, it consists of a it consists of a uh, it's a it's a it's a vector of linear recurrent sequences. Now, for holonomic sequences, it's a good question. I guess there are connections, but your Markov chain would have to somehow change at every. It, it, it won't be Markovian because it will remember the time. Um, well, it could be time dependent, so you have time dependent, dependent Markov chains. Exactly. exactly. But then, is is it? I guess you're you're the expert. Uh, am I correct in thinking the Markovian property is meant to be memoryless? Mm, well, that's one very strict form of it. But you can have so so called time inhomogeneous Markov chains where it does depend on time, but it's still I, Markov because it doesn't depend on the history, just on the current time. I understand. I think in that case, then there would be connections because you can mm -hmm. you can formulate these things as uh, in in a matricial way, but your matrix will varies over time. And I think that would be interesting to, to investigate and something I absolutely haven't done at this point. Thank you. I have another question unless somebody else wants to go. 
No, okay. So you had a lot of connections to different kinds of special functions, notably hypergeometric, but many others as well, which are, as you described them, orthogonal polynomials. Yes. Now, these often, often arise from the representation theory of Lie groups. Yes. And I'm wondering if there's some, okay, this is a flaky question, I admit, but I'm wondering if there's some kind of connection to Lie theory that that is hiding inside this theory of holonomic functions. I am, I am pretty confident there is. Uh, in fact, this is something I was discussing with Ben um, uh, uh, recently, but at the moment, um, our thoughts on this are, are a little bit too, um, uh, not sufficiently well formed to, to sort of uh, discuss, but perhaps um, be happy to discuss privately um, offline. Uh, so I think, yes, I think there are connections to, to, to link groups in the algebras. Um, but but they yeah they they so we're we're sort of exploring some of these things. Groovy. So very good, very very good, uh, uh, a, a very um, uh, uh, opposite question, Prakash. 